All right, so here is segment three of learning module one, and we are heading into the second part of learning module one, discussing what is physical anthropology specifically. So here's another list of vocabulary that's also available on Blackboard. And then here are the learning objectives. So number one, understand the modern goals of biological and or physical anthropology as a subfield of anthropology. Understand how physical anthropology started and how its motivations as a discipline changed over time. Number three, be able to identify the various types of disciplines that make up and contribute to physical anthropology and what they specifically study. And number four, be able to draw out the various steps of the scientific method and evaluate how they contribute to the making of scientific theories. Okay. Uh, to begin with, I just love this quote by Carl Sagan. Uh, it says, every kid starts out as a natural born scientist and then we beat it out of them. A few trickle through the system with their wonder and enthusiasm for science intact. Because the truth is, is that we all start off as scientists because really what is a scientist? A scientist is someone who uh, makes observations about the world and experiments in order to come up with answers to questions. So uh, we start off when we're young, we babies and toddlers, and we certainly explore the world in lots of different ways. And then we um, ask lots of questions when we're finally able to. And then we also experiment, right? We try out different ways of doing things and figuring out how the world works. So that's a, a natural instinct of ours is to do science. Uh, and then we go to school and for some of us, we get kind of a bad taste for science because uh, it becomes very limited and structured and, and you have to do it in a certain way and then it kind of turns us off of science, right? Uh, so hopefully for the, the purpose of this course, uh, if you're not really science oriented or if you don't have a, a strong interest in science naturally, um, just, just remember, just remember that you started out that way as a kid and that uh, hopefully this will inspire that childlike wonder a little bit uh, in order to uh, think about uh, why the world is the way it is. So uh, I, I hope for the purposes of this course that we are encouraging that uh, child scientist within us. Okay, so we left off talking before about physical and biological anthropology, and this is just that definition once again about um, what that is. Uh, and <clears throat> I always get this question by students: Why is there? Why are there two different names for the the subfield? Right? Why do we say physical anthropology or biological anthropology? And it really reflects the history of the discipline, right? Because anthropology as a field really started, well, first of all, you know, anthropology is, you know, we, we've been doing it for human, from, as humans for thousands of years, you know, uh, the ancient Greeks wrote down, you know, all of their different observations about the world. They made sort of basic uh, scientific observations and then cultural observations, they certainly were interested <coughs> in understanding cultures around the world. Uh, and so uh, we've been doing that for thousands of years, but as a sort of this official academic discipline, it really took off in Victorian England in the 1800s, okay? So you can imagine there's a bunch of, I don't know, probably some rich white dudes who are sitting around uh, and don't have a lot to do, and they became armchair anthropologists. Uh, we also have to remember Europe in the 1800s, you know, for especially England is experiencing a huge surge in colonial power. So they're exploring a lot of the world through seagoing vessels and then also um, taking political, economic, and social control of a lot of other countries. They're coming into contact with lots of different cultures around the world. So of course this is fueling curiosity because basically people are coming into contact with other types of humans that they've never seen before. They're seeing lots of differences between the different races, for example. And of course that leads to the question of why? Why are humans different? Why do we look so different from one another? And what do those differences really mean? 
So you have these armchair anthropologists who are doing all sorts of things like taking measurements, right? They're taking measurements of, of body parts and um, and they're coming up with some interesting conclusions as they do their comparisons. So one great example uh, in the 1800s and, and early 1900s was um, cranial analysis, looking at the size and shape of the cranium. And what's interesting is if you do a racial comparison of cranial size, you do see some differences on average. So for example, Europeans tend to have slightly, and I mean slightly larger crania than let's say African peoples or Asian peoples. Uh, and so um, if you can imagine when you come up with that sort of conclusion where you see, you know, differences in average, uh, you, it's very easy to take the next step, right? So in the 1800s, as people were coming into contact with these other cultures and ultimately trying to justify their colonial agendas, oftentimes they would use research such as this, lo noting these physical differences in, in, in variation of characteristics um, <clears throat> in order to support which would be a rather racist agenda, right? So they would come to the conclusion, for example, that because European crania on average are slightly larger, that this somehow means that they are more intelligent and thus more superior. And of course, it makes sense that they would be the ones ruling over those people who are less superior, right? So uh, it's really unfortunate that that's sort of kind of how anthropology began, or at least physical anthropology began, uh, is sort of justifying these racial agendas. Today, of course, we know that uh, intelligence really doesn't have a whole lot to do with cranial size. Um, uh, today, modern intelligence or IQ has a lot more to do with how the brain is organized so nothing really to do with brain size, but ra rather the organization of the brain itself. Uh, and so uh, it's, it, it's a, unfortunate that anthropology kind of started off with these like really kind of crude comparisons between peoples. But from there, <clears throat> people started to begin to ask more questions, fortunately. And by the 1950s, is when we start to see that anthropology really gets a lot of impact from science and we see that that uh, new scientific fields are emerging as a result of the discovery of DNA and our understand modern understanding of genetics that all begins in the 1940s 1950s and so uh, it's at that time that physical anthropology uh, became known more as biological anthropology uh, because uh, it sort of reflected this scientific bent. So there's some biological anthropologists that are very adamant that they are not physical anthropologists, they're biological anthropologists to show this sort of disconnect from what physical anthropology was back in the 1800s. But at least for the purposes of this course, I think that the modern, you know, general population you know, recognizes the term physical anthropology a lot more commonly. So uh, I use physical and biological anthropology interchangeably. And, you know, I think for me, uh, physical anthropology kind of rolls off the tongue a little bit easier. And so uh, really, though, it, it's it's the same thing. And so uh, I just wanted to share that history about the discipline, though, in that it has changed. And fortunately, today it has uh, shown this change in uh, the objectives, the goals of anthropology, uh, physical anthropology being not to support racist agen agendas, but rather uh, to understand all human variation. Right, so there are a variety of sub-disciplines that are dedicated to looking at human variation, where it came from, comparing to other things, uh, ultimately understanding human origins. Right, so uh, this all really came to a head in 1859, which you don't have to know this exact date, by the way, but this is just to give you historical context, right? So once again, this is, this is during Victorian England time, and it comes to a head in 1859 at, with the publication of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. And we'll be going into a lot more information about Darwin and coming uh, learning modules. But uh, 
this is a time when natural historians, which is what scientists were called back then, they weren't called scientists, they were called natural historians. They were looking at the world around them and they were seeing huge amounts of biological variation. You know, they saw a huge diversity of species around the world. And, you know, up until this point, up until the mid 1800s, the prevailing paradigm of Europe in particular was the biblical account of creation, right? That was what um, was sort of held as truth, so to speak, that um, that's that's how things happened. And that um, that it actually was fairly recent in time that the earth was uh, created. But this is a time period when, you know, new evidence is coming out. They're doing things like pulling huge fossils out of the ground. And, you know, there are big dinosaur bones that, you know, of course, you don't see dinosaurs uh, at this time period anymore. And, you know, people are wondering where these things came from and that leads to questions about antiquity of the earth and they're studying geology and of course that leads to studying uh, or, or questioning the antiquity of humanity and so forth so this is really coming to a head in the mid mid 1800s just as we're starting to explore the world and uh and and, and get a better understanding of um different peoples around the world as well. So uh, everything is, is sort of accumulating at this point to a discipline that is centered on figuring out why we see all of the diversity that we see around the world. So one of the major disciplines that contribute to physical anthropology is paleoanthropology. And if we were to break down the term paleoanthropology. We already uh, know that anthropology is the study of humans, but uh, paleo means old or ancient. Okay, so in this context, paleoanthropology means the study of ancient humans, or in this case, the hominid ancestors of humans, right? So it's the study of human evolution as revealed through the fossil record. Have you ever heard this term before? The fossil record, right? What are we talking about here? We're not talking about records like those those thin, flat, black things that you used to play music with. No, no, no. We're talking about a record of everything that has been found, right? So something that's sort of written down a catalog of fossils, in this case, fossils. So the fossil record is are all of the fossils that have ever been found right? That's what we mean by the fossil record. So in the pursuit of figuring out human origins and human evolution, uh, there are really three different goals of paleoanthropology. The first is to identify the various early hominid species, which is actually quite a challenging thing to do. Because when you can observe the natural world, and you know, natural historians had been doing this for several centuries up in, uh, at this point, um, describing the natural world, writing books about it, uh, making classifications and all of that. Um, the easiest way to figure this out is by ob observation, right? You can observe groups of plants and animals and how they reproduce. And so that's ultimately how you can figure out a species. But when all you have are fossils, it's really difficult to uh, tell what is a species and what isn't a species based on bones, right? Because if you see differences in the bones, uh, is that just variation within one species or is it actually an indicator of another species? So a lot of time and energy is devoted in paleoanthropology to first of all, just figuring out the different species. And then to establish a chronological sequence of relationships amongst these species, because honestly, there's nothing more important than figuring out the order of this. The order of these fossil species helps us to understand how traits evolved over time. And today, you know, we have a, a wide variety of methods that help us in establishing chronology or, or uh, uh, labeling uh, time and dates and stuff like that. Um, and we'll be talking more about dating techniques actually later in the course. Uh, but <clears throat> we can see that, that it's vitally important for us to know the sequence of these species to understand the progression here.
So we've come to the end of segment three. Please join me for segment four.